Section 2 of Myths Every Child Should Know. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Myths Every Child Should Know, edited by Hamilton Wright Maybe. Section 2 The Three Golden Apples, Part 2. You must understand that the old man of the sea, though he generally looked so much like the wave-beaten figurehead of a vessel, had the power of assuming any shape he pleased. When he found himself so roughly seized by Hercules, he had been in hopes of putting him in such surprise and terror by these magical transformations that the hero would be glad to let him go. If Hercules had relaxed his grasp, the old one would certainly have plunged down to the very bottom of the sea, whence he would not soon have given himself the trouble of coming up in order to answer any impertinent questions. Ninety-nine people out of a hundred, I suppose, would have been frightened out of their wits by the very first of his ugly shapes, and would have taken to their heels at once. For one of the hardest things in this world is to see the difference between real dangers and imaginary ones. But as Hercules held on so stubbornly, and only squeezed the old one so much the tighter at every change of shape, and really put him in no small torture, he finally thought it best to reappear in his own figure. So there he was again, a fishy, scaly, web-footed sort of personage, with something like a tuft of seaweed at his chin. "'Pray, what do you want with me?' cried the old one, as soon as he could take breath for it is quite a tiresome affair to go through so many false shapes. Why do you squeeze me so hard? Let me go this moment, or I shall begin to consider you an extremely uncivil person. My name is Hercules, roared the mighty stranger, and you will never get out of my clutch until you tell me the nearest way to the garden of the Hesperides. When the old fellow heard who it was that had caught him, he saw with half an eye that it would be necessary to tell him everything he wanted to know. The old one was an inhabitant of the sea, you must recollect, and roamed about everywhere like other seafaring people. Of course, he had often heard of the fame of Hercules, and of the wonderful things that he was constantly performing in various parts of the earth, and how determined he always was to accomplish whatever he undertook. He therefore made no more attempts to escape, but told the hero how to find the garden of the Hesperides, and likewise warned him of many difficulties which must be overcome before he could arrive thither. "'You must go on thus and thus,' said the old man of the sea, after taking the points of the compass, "'till you come into sight of a very tall giant who holds the sky on his shoulders, and the giant if he happens to be in the humor, will tell you exactly where the garden of the Hesperides lies. And if the giant happens not to be in the humor, remarked Hercules, balancing his club on the tip of his finger, perhaps I shall find means to persuade him. Thanking the old man of the sea, and begging his pardon for having squeezed him so roughly, the hero resumed his journey. He met with a great many strange adventures, which would be well worth your hearing, if I had leisure to narrate them as minutely as they deserve. It was in this journey, if I mistake not, that he encountered a prodigious giant, who was so wonderfully contrived by nature, that every time he touched the earth he became ten times as strong as ever he had been before. His name was Antaeus. You may see plainly enough that it was a very difficult business to fight with such a fellow, for as often as he got a knock-down blow, up he started again, stronger, fiercer, and abler to use his weapons than if his enemy had let him alone. Thus the harder Hercules pounded the giant with his club, the further he seemed from winning the victory. I have sometimes argued with such people, but never fought with one. The only way in which Hercules found it possible to finish the battle was by lifting Antaeus up off his feet into the air, and squeezing him, and squeezing him, until finally the strength was quite squeezed out of his enormous body. When this affair was finished, Hercules continued his travels, and went to the land of Egypt, where he was taken prisoner, and would have been put to death, if he had not slain the king of the country, and made his escape. 
passing through the deserts of Africa and going as fast as he could, he arrived at last on the shore of the great ocean. And here, unless he could walk on the crests of the billows, it seemed as if his journey must needs be at an end. Nothing was before him save the foaming, dashing, measureless ocean. But suddenly, as he looked toward the horizon, he saw something a great way off, which he had not seen the moment before. It gleamed very brightly, almost as you may have beheld the round golden disk of the sun when it rises or sets over the edge of the world. It evidently drew nearer, for at every instant this wonderful object became larger and more lustrous. At length it had come so nigh that Hercules discovered it to be an immense cup or bowl made either of gold or burnished brass. How it had got afloat upon the sea is more than I can tell you. There it was, at all events, rolling on the tumultuous billows which tossed it up and down and heaved their foamy tops against its sides, but without ever throwing their spray over the brim. I have seen many giants in my time, thought Hercules, but never one that would need to drink his wine out of a cup like this. And true enough, what a cup it must have been. It was as large, as large, but in short, I'm afraid to say how immeasurably large it was. To speak within bounds, it was ten times larger than a great mill wheel, and all of metal as it was, it floated over the heaving surges more lightly than an acorn cup adown the brook. The waves tumbled it onward until it grazed against the shore within a short distance of the spot where Hercules was standing. As soon as this happened, he knew what was to be done for he had not gone through so many remarkable adventures without learning pretty well how to conduct himself whenever anything came to pass a little out of the common rule. It was just as clear as daylight that this marvelous cup had been set adrift by some unseen power and guided hitherward in order to carry Hercules across the sea on his way to the garden of the Hesperides. Accordingly, without a moment's delay, he clambered over the brim and slid down on the inside, where, spreading out his lion's skin, he proceeded to take a little repose. He had scarcely rested until now, since he bade farewell to the damsels on the margin of the river. The waves dashed with a pleasant and ringing sound against the circumference of the hollow cup. It rocked lightly to and fro, and the motion was so soothing that it speedily rocked Hercules into an agreeable slumber. His nap had probably lasted a good while, when the cup chanced to graze against a rock, and in consequence immediately resounded and reverberated through its golden or brazen substance a hundred times as loudly as ever you heard a church bell. The noise awoke Hercules, who instantly started up and gazed around him, wondering whereabouts he was. He was not long in discovering that the cup had floated across a great part of the sea, and was approaching the shore of what seemed to be an island. And on that island, what do you think he saw? No, you will never guess it. Not if you were to try fifty thousand times. It positively appears to me that this was the most marvelous spectacle that had ever been seen by Hercules in the whole course of his wonderful travels and adventures. It was a greater marvel than the hydra with nine heads, which kept growing twice as fast as they were cut off. Greater than the six-legged man monster. Greater than Antaeus. Greater than anything that was ever beheld by anybody before or since the days of Hercules, or than anything that remains to be beheld by travelers in all time to come. It was a giant but such an intolerably big giant, a giant as tall as a mountain, so vast a giant that the clouds rested about his midst like a girdle, and hung like a hoary beard from his chin, and flitted before his huge eyes, so that he could neither see Hercules nor the golden cup in which he was voyaging. And most wonderful of all, the giant held up his great hands and appeared to support the sky, which, so far as Hercules could discern through the clouds, was resting upon his head. This does really seem almost too much to believe. Meanwhile, 
The bright cup continued to float onward and finally touched the strand. Just then a breeze wafted away the clouds from before the giant's visage, and Hercules beheld it with all its enormous features, eyes each of them as big as yonder lake, a nose a mile long, and a mouth of the same width. It was a countenance terrible from its enormity of size, but disconsolate and weary, even as you may see the faces of many people nowadays who are compelled to sustain burdens above their strength. What the sky was to the giant, such are the cares of earth to those who let themselves be weighed down by them. And whenever men undertake what is beyond the just measure of their abilities, they encounter precisely such a doom as had befallen this poor giant. Poor fellow! He had evidently stood there a long while. An ancient forest had been growing and decaying around his feet, and oak trees of six or seven centuries old had sprung from the acorn and forced themselves between his toes. The giant now looked down from the far height of his great eyes, and perceiving Hercules, roared out in a voice that resembled thunder proceeding out of the cloud that had just flitted away from his face. "'Who are you down at my feet there? And whence do you come in that little cup?' "'I am Hercules,' thundered back the hero, in a voice pretty nearly or quite as loud as the giant's own, "'and I am seeking for the garden of the Hesperides.' "'Ho, ho, ho!' roared the giant, in a fit of immense laughter. "'That is a wise adventure, truly!' "'And why not?' cried Hercules, getting a little angry at the giant's mirth. "'Do you think I am afraid of the dragon with a hundred heads?' Well, just at this time, while they were talking together, some black clouds gathered around the giant's middle, and burst out into a tremendous storm of thunder and lightning, causing such a pother that Hercules found it impossible to distinguish a word. Only the giant's immeasurable legs were to be seen, standing up into the obscurity of the tempest, and now and then a momentary glimpse of his whole figure, mantled in a volume of mist. He seemed to be speaking most of the time, but his big, deep, rough voice chimed in with the reverberations of the thunderclaps and rolled away over the hills like them. Thus, by talking out of season, the foolish giant expended an incalculable quantity of breath to no purpose, for the thunder spoke quite as intelligibly as he. At last the storm swept over as suddenly as it had come and there again was the clear sky, and the weary giant holding it up, and the pleasant sunshine beaming over his vast height and illuminating it against the background of the sullen thunder-clouds. So far above the shower had been his head that not a hair of it was moistened by the raindrops. When the giant could see Hercules still standing on the seashore, he roared out to him anew, I am Atlas, the mightiest giant in the world, and I hold the sky upon my head. So I see, answered Hercules, but can you show me the way to the garden of the Hesperides? What do you want there? asked the giant. I want three of the golden apples, shouted Hercules, for my cousin the king. There is nobody but myself, quoth the giant that can go to the garden of the Hesperides and gather the golden apples. If it were not for this little business of holding up the sky, I would make half a dozen steps across the sea and get them for you. You are very kind, replied Hercules, and cannot you rest the sky upon a mountain? None of them is quite high enough, said Atlas, shaking his head. But if you were to take your stand on the summit of that nearest one, your head would be pretty nearly on a level with mine. You seem to be a fellow of some strength. What if you should take my burden on your shoulders while I do your errand for you? Hercules, as you must be careful to remember, was a remarkably strong man, and though it certainly requires a great deal of muscular power to uphold the sky, yet if any mortal could be supposed capable of such an exploit, he was the one. Nevertheless, it seemed so difficult an undertaking that for the first time in his life he hesitated. Is the sky very heavy? he inquired. Why, not particularly so at first, answered the giant, shrugging his shoulders, but it gets to be a little burdensome after a thousand years. And how long a time, asked the hero, will it take you to get the golden apples? 
Oh, that will be done in a few moments, cried Atlas. I shall take ten or fifteen miles at a stride and be at the garden and back again before your shoulders begin to ache. Well, then, answered Hercules, I will climb the mountain behind you there and relieve you of your burden. The truth is, Hercules had a kind heart of his own and considered that he should be doing the giant a favor by allowing him this opportunity for a ramble. And besides, he thought that it would be still more for his own glory if he could boast of upholding the sky than merely to do so ordinary a thing as to conquer a dragon with a hundred heads. Accordingly, without more words, the sky was shifted from the shoulders of Atlas and placed upon those of Hercules. When this was safely accomplished, the first thing that the giant did was to stretch himself, and you may imagine what a prodigious spectacle he was then. Next he slowly lifted one of his feet out of the forest that had grown up around it, then the other. Then all at once he began to caper and leap and dance for joy at his freedom, flinging himself nobody knows how high into the air, and floundering down again with a shock that made the earth tremble. And then he laughed, ho, 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 with a thunderous roar that was echoed from the mountains far and near, as if they and the giant had been so many rejoicing brothers. When his joy had a little subsided, he stepped into the sea, ten miles at the first stride, which brought him mid-leg deep, and ten miles at the second, when the water came just above his knees, and ten miles more at the third, by which he was immersed nearly to his waist. This was the greatest depth of the sea. Hercules watched the giant as he still went onward, for it was really a wonderful sight. This immense human form, more than thirty miles off, half hidden in the ocean, but with his upper half as tall and misty and blue as a distant mountain. At last the gigantic shape faded entirely out of view. And now Hercules began to consider what he should do in case Atlas should be drowned in the sea, or if he were to be stung to death by the dragon with a hundred heads, which guarded the golden apples of the Hesperides. If any such misfortune were to happen, how could he ever get rid of the sky? And by the by, its weight began already to be a little irksome to his head and shoulders. I really pity the poor giant, thought Hercules, if it wearies me so much in ten minutes. How much must it have wearied him in a thousand years? Oh, my sweet little people, you have no idea what a weight there was in that same blue sky, which looked so soft and aerial above our heads. And there, too, was the bluster of the wind, and the chill, and the watery clouds, and the blazing sun, all taking their turns to make Hercules uncomfortable. He began to be afraid that the giant would never come back. He gazed wistfully at the world beneath him, and acknowledged to himself that it was a far happier kind of life to be a shepherd at the foot of a mountain than to stand on its dizzy summit and bear up the firmament with his might and main. For, of course, as you will easily understand, Hercules had an immense responsibility on his mind, as well as a weight on his head and shoulders. Why, if he did not stand perfectly still and keep the sky immovable, the sun would perhaps be put ajar, or after nightfall a great many of the stars might be loosened from their places and shower down like fiery rain upon the people's heads. And how ashamed would the hero be if, knowing to his unsteadiness beneath its weight, the sky should crack and show a great fissure quite across it. I know not how long it was before to his unspeakable joy he beheld the huge shape of the giant like a cloud on the far-off edge of the sea. At his nearer approach, Atlas held up his hand in which Hercules could perceive three magnificent golden apples as big as pumpkins all hanging from one branch. I am glad to see you again, shouted Hercules, when the giant was within hearing. So you have got the golden apples. Certainly, certainly, answered Atlas and very fair apples they are. I took the finest that grew on the tree, I assure you. Ah, it is a beautiful spot, that garden of Hesperides. Yes, and the dragon with a hundred heads is a sight worth any man seeing. After all, you had better have gone for the apples yourself. No matter, replied Hercules. You have had a pleasant ramble, and have done the business as well as I could. 
I heartily thank you for your trouble, and now, as I have a long way to go, and am rather in a haste, and as the king, my cousin, is anxious to receive the golden apples, will you be kind enough to take the sky off my shoulders again? Why, as to that, said the giant, chucking the golden apples into the air twenty miles high or thereabouts, and catching them as they came down, as to that, my good friend, I consider you a little unreasonable. Cannot I carry the golden apples to the king, your cousin, much quicker than you could? As his majesty is in such a hurry to get them, I promise you to take my longest strides, and besides I have no fancy for burdening myself with the sky just now. Here Hercules grew impatient, and gave a great shrug of his shoulders. It being now twilight, you might have seen two or three stars tumble out of their places. Everybody on earth looked upward in a fright, thinking that the sky might be going to fall next. Oh, that will never do, cried Giant Atlas, with a great roar of laughter. I have not let fall so many stars within the last five centuries. By the time you've stood there as long as I did, you will begin to learn patience. What? shouted Hercules very wrathfully. Do you intend to make me bear this burden forever? We will see about that one of these days, answered the giant. At all events, you ought not to complain, if you have to bear it the next hundred years, or perhaps the next thousand. I bore it a good while longer, in spite of the backache. Well, then, after a thousand years, if I happen to feel in the mood, we may possibly shift about again. You are certainly a very strong man, and can never have a better opportunity to prove it. Posterity will talk of you, I warrant it. Pish! A fig for its talk, cried Hercules, with another hitch of his shoulders. Just take the sky upon your head one instant, will you? I want to make a cushion of my lion skin for the weight to rest upon. It really chafes me, and will cause unnecessary inconvenience in so many centuries as I am to stand here. Well, that's no more than fair, and I'll do it, quoth the giant for he had no unkind feelings toward Hercules, and was merely acting with a too selfish consideration of his own ease. For just five minutes, then, I'll take back the sky. Only for five minutes, recollect. I have no idea of spending another thousand years as I spent the last. Variety is the spice of life, say I. Ah, the thick-witted old rogue of a giant. He threw down the golden apples, and received back the sky from the head and shoulders of Hercules upon his own, where it rightly belonged. And Hercules picked up the three golden apples, that were as big or bigger than pumpkins, and straightway set out on his journey homeward, without paying the slightest heed to the thundering tones of the giant, who bellowed after him to come back. Another forest sprang up around his feet, and grew ancient there, and again might be seen oak trees of six or seven centuries old that had waxed thus aged betwixt his enormous toes. And there stands the giant to this day, or at any rate there stands a mountain as tall as he, and which bears his name, and when the thunder rumbles about its summit we may imagine it to be the voice of giant Atlas bellowing after Hercules. End of section two.